Welcome to episode 245 of the Read Aloud Revival podcast, the show that helps your kids fall in love with books and helps you fall in love with homeschooling. I'm your host, Sarah McKenzie. Right now, we are also the show that helps you fall in love with reading fairy tales to your children, or at least I hope that's true. (laughs) In episode 243, we talked all about why fairy tales aren't like other stories, why they matter more and make a bigger difference in your child's life than most other stories do. Today, we're going to talk about how. Now, As soon as we realize that fairy tales are full of gospel truth and symbolism and deep, meaningful resonance, many of us start to wonder, should we point this out to our kids? Should we tell our kids about it? Fairy tales often follow one of two main narrative structures. In many, many fairy tales, the narrative ends with a wedding feast. These are, you know, wedding feast fairy tales. They often involve a prince rescuing a princess, getting married, and end with a wedding feast. So for example, Sleeping Beauty. In Sleeping Beauty, the princess falls into a deep sleep, is awakened by a kiss from the prince, gets married, and there's a marriage feast. Sleep, then, in Sleeping Beauty, is analogous to death. And being awakened by a kiss from the prince, resurrection. And the marriage feast is very much like the wedding supper of the Lamb. Christ and his church, of course, are often described in Scripture as bridegroom and bride. And yes, our bridegroom will rescue us and give us our happily ever after in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see this time and time again in these wedding feast fairy tales. There are these threads of truth that remind us of something that's truer than true, right? Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, most of the princess tales, they tell this gospel truth that we know, which is why G.K. Chesterton said, the gospel is a fairy tale come true. Because fairy tales have a certain form, and the gospel is also told in that form. And that's why, as we discussed in episode 243 of this podcast, Angelina Stanford said that fairy tales are truer than true, because they impart this true narrative structure that we know is right, like deep in our souls. The other really common narrative structure in fairy tales involves not a wedding feast, but the reuniting of parents and children. So parents and children are separated and need to be reunited. So stories like Hansel and Gretel. Actually, Snow White does this too. Um, Rapunzel, I could go on. (laughs) They're all essentially stories about children being separated from their parents. And of course, we know the original, you know, the scriptural story of children being separated from their parents in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden is them being separated from God, right? And then the whole rest of scripture tells the story of reuniting with our father. Every time I hear someone really wise talk about the symbolism and the deep gospel messages of fairy tales, especially Grimm's fairy tales, I feel sort of like the top of my head comes off. I wonder if That's happening to you as I mention these stories. I mean, that apple in Snow White has an awful lot in common with the apple in the Garden of Eden. These are the things you can't unsee once you see them. They're precisely why fairy tales aren't just mere stories. I also miss them, usually. Someone has to point them out to me. I wouldn't have known that the apple in Snow White is like the apple in the Garden of Eden I would have known that until someone points it out. Then it seems really obvious. But maybe you wonder, like I did, should we learn what all these fairy tales mean and then tell our children? So then when we're reading Snow White, for example, should we point out the similarities between the fairy tale and the story in the Bible? Should we point out the symbolism and all the underlying meanings? Or, you know, should we point out that Cinderella's virtue is what makes her beautiful? You know, in the original grim version of that story, Cinderella and her stepsisters are all equally physically beautiful. What makes Cinderella more beautiful than her stepsisters is not physical beauty like it is in the Disney movie. In the original Grimm, it's her virtue. I mean, should we point this out to our kids? 
This is a question that I've asked. I know many of you probably have too. And it's really emphatically agreed upon by those same experts who can teach us so much about the gospel correlation in fairy tales that no, we should not tell our children these things. We should not point them out to our kids. I want to pass the microphone, so to speak, to someone who really knows and has discussed exactly this. Dr. Vegan Goroyan wrote a tremendous book on fairy tales called Tending the Heart of Virtue. I mentioned this book in episode 243. And my friend Haley Stewart, who is the host of the Votive podcast for Word on Fire, she recently interviewed Dr. Goroyan, and he spoke about this very tendency to want to, as parents, explain what's happening in fairy tales to children, to sort of pick them apart in front of our children. And he cautions us not to do that. Haley, in this episode, asks if we should try to parse meaning and then pass that on to our kids as we're reading fairy tales. Listen to what Dr. Goroyan says in his response. The kinds of mistakes we make in instructing children in literature summarize the story. Well, then you invite them to ignore the movement of the narrative, and they try to reduce it to almost a concept. What's the main point of the story or the main thesis? That's a mistake. Again, it's reductive, and it, it moves them to a kind of reasoning which escapes the imagination. They abandon the imagine, ma their imaginative powers, and rationalization takes place, and that's a mistake. So you have to le leap into the story and let the so story take you. Just leap into the river and let it take you where it will. And that's true about all stories, I think. I love that, and it does go against kind of what we often think of as this is part of a child's education, they have to do the book report or complete this assignment that some way to quantify how much they've learned. And yet that's often counterproductive to the more important piece of that education, that their imagination is starting to be formed and they're diving in and using a different part of their mind. You can listen to that whole episode in your podcast app. It's the Word on Fire Votive Podcast, and the episode is called Why Fairy Tales Are Essential Reading. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. You know how in many kids' movies, there are jokes that are there for the parents? You can watch, I don't know, anything from Pixar, Disney, you know, Finding Nemo or whatever. And it's like the filmmakers left jokes in there or put jokes in there that only the adults would see. And it actually usually makes the movie a bit more interesting and enjoyable for the adults who are watching it with their children. They're oftentimes um, not appropriate jokes. <laughs> They're oftentimes a little debasing. Well, the same thing oftentimes happens in fairy tales, except they elevate the adult instead of <laughs> being something that like... It reduces us to something less than what we are. So just as the adult watching the movie with their child might see things that they didn't see before when they watch the movie with their kids, fairy tales do something differently. You know, you just read the story with your ch child and the story itself is enough. But then you're edified in a different way because you're getting something different from the story than your child is. Something you're ready for that you now that you're an adult that you weren't ready for as a child because as a child the story itself is the thing this is why c.s lewis famously wrote in a dedication of one of the narnia books someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again he wrote that to his goddaughter i believe because as small children, we just hear the story or read the story, and it becomes part of us. As adults, we read them, and we start to see connections there, and we enjoy them in a whole new way, especially if someone points them out to us. If you're like me, and you're like, I missed all of that till someone pointed it out. But what we're actually doing when we read fairy tales is presenting them to our kids so they can love them. That's the point. That's the goal. Not so that they can see why Snow White eating the apple is like Eve eating the apple in the Garden of Eden. Or not so we can say, ooh, see what the Grimm brothers did there? <laughs> Sleeping Beauty falls asleep, and that's like death. And only true love's kiss can awaken her just the way 
love from God is only how we ourselves are saved. I mean, that's true. And it's amazing. And it's so cool as an adult reading these fairy tales to see it, which is why you get to be old enough to read fairy tales again. And it's why now when I read Snow White with my kids, I enjoy it every bit as much as they are. They're enjoying it for where they are. And I'm enjoying it at a different, deeper level. And everybody gets what they're fit for. Um, I recently listened to an episode of the Symbolic World podcast, and it spoke just to this. So in the episode, the episode itself is called Fairy Tales as the Music of the Spheres. The show is hosted by Jonathan Peugeot. And in this particular episode, he is sharing a conference session that he gave recently, and he's just playing the conference session. And the whole thing is excellent. It's heady. I mean, there's no intro, so you're going to listen to this episode, and if you do that, you'll you'll feel like you just dropped in on a college-level lecture halfway in. <laughs> but at the end of this particular episode, one of the conference attendees asked Jonathan Peugeot a question, and I just loved Jonathan's response. Listen in. Is the purpose of fairy tales different for adults than for children, and or is there something different adults are supposed to get out of it than children? I think, yes, I think adults can get different things out of fairy tales, and it has to do in some ways with play. So it's the same with music, right? It's like when you start with a child, you say, just play the piece, like, you know, do the different exercises, and they learn the exercises. And then as you get older, at some point, then you can listen to a fugue, and you can notice the great things that Bach is doing, you know, in taking you out of the pattern and then hinting at it and teasing you and then bringing you back. And you can actually more consciously see what's going on. And I think that that's what adults can do. And it's actually fun, as a, especially the fairy tales you know really well as a child and that you, you knew. And to, as an adult, now go back and say, I'm going to take this seriously. And all of a sudden, you can see these beautiful things. They can unfold riches in a more conscious and intellectual way that can be quite fun. And more than fun, but that can actually reveal to you some deep mysteries, actually even about scripture, by the way. There are some things that I've understood in scripture that I understood because I was reading fairy tales, that all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's one of the things that's going on. And because it, it's close, but it's not. And so it makes you think of the scriptural story differently and it kind of, it reflects back on it. And you think, What's the, why is it different? Why is it the same? Children love fairy tales. You don't have to explain the fairy tales to them, especially now when they're super young. They just love to hear them. And so it's like rejoice. It's wonderful. They love the stories. And then as they get older, then you can tease out the applications, you know. Isn't that beautiful? For most of the best books, you can read them to a wide range of ages. And everyone takes what they're fit for. So you can read, for example, C.S. Lewis's the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And your four-year-old will be enchanted, and your 10-year-old will be enchanted, but will experience it differently than the four-year-old. And your 17-year-old, same thing. They will love it, but they will read it and get something different than the four-year-old and the 10-year-old. And so will you, by the way. You'll get something different from it than your four-year-old, your 10-year-old, your 17-year-old. You'll see things you hadn't seen there in all the previous readings you might have done. It'll be a new experience because of who you are, where you're at, what stage you're ready for. The book itself is a feast, and it offers something for everyone depending on their ages. Fairy tales do the same. I know for me, every time I read Little Women, I get something different from it. Um, I got something different from it when I read it at 40 than I did when I read it in my early 30s. Definitely different than when I first read it as a teen. Because we get what we're ready to get. And when it comes to fairy tales, our young children are ready to fall in love with the story. And that's enough. It becomes a part of them. And then as they grow, they naturally begin to make some connections and see things like, how interesting that in so many fairy tales, the princess falls into a deep sleep and has to be awakened by the prince. Huh. Why are there apples in so many fairy tales, right? We see things. We see them with our soul, see them implicitly, right? Even if they can't quite articulate what they're seeing, Jonathan Peugeot says, they see it implicitly with their attention. They see the fairy tale implicitly. Then as we get older, we start to make these connections. We start to see the metaphors. We start to see the patterns. 
patterns is probably a better word. We start to see that there is a pattern in these fairy tales where a princess falls asleep and has to be awakened by a prince. And what does that mean? And why does it show up again and again? And what else happens in the story surrounding it? Why does Sleeping Beauty prick her finger on a spindle? What does that actually mean? Because the spindle's not actually sharp. So why? <laughs> and I usually need someone to show me. I usually need someone like Jonathan Pajot to tell me, look at all of the symbols. Look at all the patterns that are in this story. Look at what I can see here. Exactly the way that a, a teacher who is really excited about something invites their students to look at it. I always like to picture... As a homeschooling mother, I always like to try to remember that I'm like beach combing and I'm finding a seashell and I'm holding it up and saying, look at this, look what I found. Oh my goodness, look at how this pattern moves over here. Did you see that? That's so different than a teacher who comes in with a posture of come sit down, I'm going to teach you all the things you need to know. I'm going to fill your head with content, right? No, our kids see the fairy tales implicitly, as Jonathan Pajot said, and then as adults, we can listen to someone unpack a fairy tale, unpack Cinderella or Snow White or Puss in Boots or any other fairy tale. And it's just as enjoyable for us as for our kids to read these stories because we're finally old enough, as C.S. Lewis says, to enjoy fairy tales again. And now we want someone to show us all the analogies and patterns that are there. And because we love the stories and have been formed by them, we're ready for it. I really appreciated that analogy that Jonathan Peugeot used in the episode where he says that reading fairy tales to a young child is like teaching a child to play the piano. You know, first you want them to love the music, to like hear the music in their soul, just to love it. And then they learn to play Bach. They're not dissecting it. They're not doing like music theory. They're not unpacking all the different movements. They're listening to the music, they're hearing the music, they're playing the music, and they get to know box music on a soul level. And then, when they're a little older, we can start pulling it apart. And because they love it already, they're willing to, interested in hearing what's different. If someone approached me with Snow White, and the first time I read it, it was picked apart, it would have ruined the story. But as an adult who loves the story, because I was formed by it as a child, like most of us have been, whether we know it or not, we see the truth in it and it resonates. It's a little bit to me like the difference between a child playing with a frog that they caught in a pond and watching the way it moves and how its legs stretch and how it moves through space and how it sounds, how it feels in your hands. That's a very different experience than dissecting a dead frog on a table, picking apart a frog in dissection. The dissection itself isn't bad. I don't like doing it. It's just not what comes first. Who cares what the inside of a frog is like unless you love the frog? First, we love. And then that love helps us pick things apart later. It's why in RAR Premium, I always do a video helping kids look closely at a story, doing the same thing where I feel like I'm beachcombing and I'm finding a seashell and saying, look what I found. Look what I found in the hero's journey of On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. Look what I found in the alliterative use that this author chose. And it's so fun, but it doesn't happen first. The first thing you do is read the story, always. And I even say that in the videos. First, read the story because the story is going to be the thing you fall in love with. We don't shape loves by picking anything apart or dissecting it. We shape loves by giving stories. And fairy tales, above all, are an opportunity to shape our children's loves, to give them the opportunity to love that which is lovely, to love that which is true. I've heard Jonathan Peugeot describe fairy tales as a tuning fork for your soul. You know, our souls resonate with the truth, which is why fairy tales have stood the test of time. Because our souls resonate with the truth there. And then they set this tune and our souls resonate to be in tune with them, which is why we love them so much. It's why there's so many versions of Cinderella all over the world in all sorts of cultures, because there is an underlying truth in that story that our souls resonate with. And we also find that truth in the gospel, which is why the gospel is a fairy tale that really came true. So how do we read a fairy tale? Well, we read it aloud. We just present it 
We let our kids fall in love with it. That's enough. You can have that same experience of having the top of your head come off by listening to someone unpack a fairy tale, you know, how they work, why they work, what the metaphors or symbols mean, what the patterns mean. In that episode that I just played a snippet from, this symbolic podcast, Jonathan Peugeot, earlier in that same episode, he takes you through Jack and the Beanstalk and he connects it to the story of Moses. And I am telling you, I had to stop the podcast because I was awestruck that I had never seen it before. I would never in a million years have described Jack and the Beanstalk as being like the story of Moses. But as soon as Jonathan Peugeot starts pointing at it, I'm like, Oh my goodness, it's right there. That's amazing. But that's for you as the adult. That's dissecting the frog. With your kids, how to read fairy tales is just to read them. Let the story do its work on the soul of your child. And then you get to listen to some really great podcasts. Let the top of your head come off so that when you sit down to read Jack and the Beanstalk or Puss in Boots or Snow White or Rumpelstiltskin, you'll go, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't see this before. And you'll enjoy it so much, as much with your kids, but you won't be unpacking it or dissecting it for them before they've been able to fall in love and be shaped by it. I'm going to put some links in the show notes to this episode of the two episodes that I shared snippets of, one from Word on Fire, Votive, and one from The Symbolic World. Um, I'm also going to share some others that I've enjoyed that I think you may enjoy if you like this idea of having somebody really wise walk you through a fairy tale. I've been enjoying listening to podcasts about fairy tales. And remember, these aren't for your kids. Your kids just need the stories. These episodes are for you. And I think you'll enjoy them. I also think you'll enjoy reading fairy tales with your kids more after you listen to them. And if you've been enjoying these fairy tale episodes here at Read Aloud Revival, you'll definitely enjoy these other episodes as well. Now, if you haven't yet, you can grab our brand new fairy tales book list so you can read fairy tales with your kids so that they too can fall in love with them, be shaped by them. You can get that fairy tale book list by texting the word fairy tale, like it's all one word, fairy tale, to the number 33777. Show notes for this episode are at readaloudrevival.com slash 245. That's where you'll find everything recommended in today's show. I'll be back in two weeks with another brand new episode. But in the meantime, you know what to do. Go make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids through books.